a very warm a very warm welcome to uh, everyone for this event by uh, friends of elephant i would like to welcome our panelists our experts uh, professor sukumar sir dr atj john singh sir mr vivek menon sir dr arun venkatraman sir hearty welcome to you all and thank you for uh, sharing your evening with us we are looking forward to uh, hearing about all the experiences and hence uh, the title of tuskers in the room today so today's talk is going to be a very special talk and once again thank you so much for joining before we uh, begin with the event i would like to uh, introduce our organization can we allow me a minute friends of elephant is not an organization and it is not proposing to become one it is an informal group of people coming together with varied expertise concerned about elephants and other wildlife the group is a forum for disseminating knowledge linked to elephants and other wildlife science conservation and welfare through art culture literature movies talks and panel discussions our expectation today is that people who have attended our events in the past you know uh, in the city during the non covid times or on their own or with the proximity to people from policy making we expect them to help us in developing appropriate conservation and welfare measures for wildlife including elephants today's schedule is as follows we will have a brief memorial talk in memory of uh, mr ajay desai and dr ram kumar and we would um, thank our uh, speakers because they are willing to share their experiences that they have had and memories that they have had followed which we will have a conversation um, which is headed by dr arun venkatraman and then we will have a question and answer session which is moderated by mr sanjay ajnikar we shall uh, begin our uh, first segment and before that i would like to have a few rules that are set in uh, i would request all the participants to kindly stay on mute um, and as and when the uh, event um, occurs uh, if you have any questions kindly put them in the chat box and i would also request all of you to um, you know please also tell us towards whom your question is directed so that it's easier for our, our uh, for our experts to also take up the questions as and when uh, it is being discussed so these are some of the house rules that i would just like to mention and without further ado i would like to start off with the very first segment to so introduce um you know uh, mr ajay desai um mr ajay desai completed his schooling in belgaum and his post graduation in marine biology from karnataka university he started his career with the bombay natural history society as a researcher and went on to spend many years focusing on studying elephant herding and track formation across indian reserves of mudumalai tr and sri lanka he has uh, he he held several cr uh, crucial positions and he played very indispensable role as former co-chair as you can see as member of the st steering committee as member of the project elephant task force task force set up by the karnataka high court to advise on the conservation of elephants so on and so forth apart from india he had also worked on elephants and other large um, mammal conservation and on training field officers in sri lanka bhutan nepal indonesia cambodia laos vietnam as well as malaysia till his last day he worked as a consultant for wwf india dr k ram kumar dr ram kumar hailed from tittai village near sirkali in uh, malathadurai district tamil nadu he completed his phd from bharti dasan university tamil nadu mr ram kumar was working for the research and conservation of diverse wild species including asian elephant and nilgiri tar for the past two decades in india he had joined wti in 2007-8 and he added value with his in-depth knowledge on looking at wildlife and connectivity 
at the landscape level, especially for elephants. Dr. Ramkumar was instrumental in mapping the elephant corridors in India, and he was the co-editor of the publication Rite of Passage, Elephant Corridors in India, the second edition. He played a key role in securing the Bayanad corridor over seven years and was also working to secure another corridor in BRT Satyamangalam uh, landscape. He has authored several research papers, papers and popular articles. He was also a great mentor and he has guided many young professionals. He had joined the Asian Elephant Specialist Group in 2017. I would now uh, request all of our uh, experts, all of the doyans who joined us today to kindly share your memories about um, Dr. Ram Kumar. And uh, I would now hand over the session to you. Thank you. Over to you, Sir Vivekman and Sir John, Sir Sukumar, Sir. I, th I think we will do this by seniority. So John Singh sir can go first. Please. I'll go last. You know, I will be very brief about uh, talking about Ajay. Already, you know, a lot has been said in the beginning itself. Whenever I remember Rajay, you know, I remember him as an ever-smiling person. He's very, very important. And humorous. And, you know, he was, one can make him laugh very easily. And he also had that quality to make others laugh. So whenever he was around, you know, there will be always laughter around him. So that is a very unique quality and always a smiling face. He was very handsome. I mean, when he joined the BNHS project, exceedingly fit because he was an athlete. I will see he was very brave also to walk in the elephant habitat and a brilliant person actually. So over the years, you know, he, has, uh, he was a mentor and role model for uh, so many younger scientists working for elephant conservation, particularly students who are, who are coming from the very, I mean, uh, very, I would say that uh, primitive background, you know, with uh, and less knowledge of English and so on. Most of them had studied in Tamil medium school and so on. And he took a great effort in molding them. So that way, you know, he was very much loved and respected for those people. And in the Mudumali landscape, you know, all the tribal Mahouts, you know, they had great admiration for him. And uh, Ajay also very, very, I mean, uh, kind to them, very fond of them, actually. Interestingly, like the tribal Mahavats, you know, he was he was not allergic to ticks, which is a huge problem in Madhumali landscape and all. He was not done. So BNHS has recently asked me to compile an article about his scientific contribution, which is available in the course of time. So when I was compiling, I found that his contribution is really uh, very, very valuable, actually. Articles, reports, books, and so on. You know, very, very... And particularly the one, you know, we have that uh, Gaja report where Mahe Chanangaraj and Sugumar and all, they have uh, written a very valuable report. And there I would say that Ajay's contribution should have been immense, actually. In that process, you know, he came in very close contact with the, I mean, Jairam Ramesh. So when he died, actually, Jairam Ramesh, you know, said, oh, he was such a wonderful person, very knowledgeable very good human being, you know, that was, these were the words, you know, Jairam Ramesh said, actually, okay, and um, two, two, in two aspects, you know, he worked which helped the elephant and tiger landscape in Mudumali landscape, one was, you know, long time ago, there was a purpose to have a railway track from Tamil Nadu to Karnataka, Patimangalam to Chamarajanagar, which would have gone along the Tipu's path, which would have broken the elephant habitat and tiger habitat, so then Ajay working with the Dalit Dalit of India, they could come up with a very good report. Using that, you know, Tamil Nadu Forest Department could say no to that, actually. Another was such a Nutino Observatory project, you know, you know project in, the, um, uh, you know, near uh, Glen Morgan Hill, you know, they wanted to have a, I mean, um, Nutino Observation, uh, what it um, drill the mountain and set up a lab actually, which would have caused a lot of disturbance to this area. So he could convince Jairam Ramesh, you know, to put an end to that and eventually that it was 
I mean, shifted from the theory actually. And um, you know, in those days, 1980s, some elephants, you know, stayed from, or I would say, migrated from Tamil Nadu into Andhra Pradesh. And they did a massive drive, actually. Mr. D.C. Daniel was also alive in there, uh, you know, to drive the elephants back into Tamil Nadu. Ajay took a very active part. They not only interested in elephants, but also in other species, like our, I mean, four on antelope, wild dogs. Whatever species you know, they came across, many of the students, you know, they did their master's dissertation studying them, actually, Adwir and so on. So I think with these words, I will stop and uh, I will always remember him. I'll miss him, actually, because I think most of the people will do that, actually, because he was such a lovable fellow, very knowledgeable and uh, very affectionate to many, many, so he'll be fondly remembered. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, John Singh. I think uh, Vivek has announced that I go next. So um, I just pick up the threads from there. Um, Ajay and um, Ram Kumar were certainly friends of the elephant. And I think it's very apt that Friends of the Elephant has uh, organized this meeting. Uh, my only quarrel will be about the, uh, the title they have given, Tuskers in the Room. Mm -hmm. Not sure whether uh, you know Tuskers are becoming Maknas over age or God knows what. <laughs> so maybe it should have been Tuskers, Tuskers and Maknas in the room. Um, let me uh, say a few words about both Ajay and about uh, Ram Kumar. Um, Ajay, I probably first met Ajay in uh, somewhere around 1985. Uh, but, you know, I think I think for a, very briefly, John Singh was the person who was uh, heading the the elephant program of the NHS in Mudumalai. I'm, I'm not very sure about the details, but uh, uh, so Ajay was one of his protégés and um, there was a, you know, another group of people, you know, Shiva Ganeshan and, and various other people who were there as part of that team. And um, uh, John Singh has uh, said that he's going to compile a, uh, an article or a report on his scientific contributions. But one thing that stands out in my opinion is that for the first time, uh, that team led by Ajay uh, came out with the you know, most objective estimates of uh, the home range of elephants of the Asian elephant. Okay. So prior to that, um, uh, uh, you know, we had some work in Sri Lanka. We had, you know, both Ajay and I had worked in India uh, you know, without the, um, you know, the tools, uh, the tools of uh, uh, the radio callers. And um, you know, in Sri Lanka, the home ranges are pretty, very small in any, in any case. And um, both Ajay and I independently, we wrote uh, articles in which just based on recitings of elephants, we came up with just estimates of 100 to 150 square kilometers as a minimum uh, home range area for the female groups. But obviously all this was wrong. And later on, uh, you know, that work showed that this was in excess of 500 square kilometers. So I think in terms of the scientific contribution, that's an early and a very significant scientific contribution. Uh, John Singh mentioned about the Gajar report. Uh, yeah, we, we worked together on the Gajar report along with various other people, including Vivek, who's here. But I should also mention another report, uh, which is not that well known. Uh, and this is the Karnataka Elephant Task Force. It was set up by the High Court of Karnataka. And uh, in that, uh, uh, myself, Ajay, uh, SS Bisht, uh, and uh, you know, Madhusudan, and uh, various other people, including Sajay Mishra of the Karnataka Forest Department, Sharad Chandra Lele of Atri and others worked on it. And uh, we had remarkable consensus on a very practical approach to elephant conservation in that report. Uh, I will, obviously, this is not the forum to get into details about it, but there was remarkable convergence in our approach that we need to find practical solutions to matters like elephant-human conflicts, you know, how do we achieve landscape scale conservation, and so on and so forth. So, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, uh, working on that report with various colleagues and including Ajay. Now coming to Ram Kumar, uh, what's uh, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know what what word to use. <laughs> but perhaps among all of us, including all people at WTI, all conservationists, and everybody at large, I was probably the last one to see him alive. Uh, Ram Kumar worked for WTI. He was based in uh, uh, Punjor in Karnataka, and he was working on a a corridor which was, uh, you know, kind of almost like a pet project for me because, you know, I, I was the one who had identified it way back in the 1980s. And Ram Kumar was uh, 
uh, working hard to make that happen. Uh, this is the Bhuti Padaga Mudarhali corridor, the BRT Satyamangalam that uh, I think uh, was mentioned in the opening remarks. And he had come down to Mudumalai in late April. Uh, I was there, I, 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 I've been in Mudumalai for several months now uh, during this COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, but, and uh, he came to discuss this with me and uh, we were discussing it and he said, it's very close to being done and I'm sure it will be done. I'm sure that WTI will take it forward. So when I heard about, he was supposed to come back again and uh, meet up with me, you know, after a couple of weeks, but that was just not to be. And the saddest part was that I did not know that he had COVID and he had succumbed to COVID uh, eventually, uh, which is, uh, you know, um, it's very, very difficult to digest that uh, piece of news, uh, but, um, but such is life, I suppose. And uh, so, you know, uh, so I have very fond memories of Ram Kumar as, you know, in the sense that we discussed how to strengthen the Mudahali Budhi Padiga corridor in the BRT uh, Satyamangalam region. And I was possibly among the last people among, uh, you know, outside his family to really see him alive. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And I think uh, Vivek uh, can share his. Uh, uh, you know, I'll say a few words about Ram Kumar. My association with Ram Kumar was very brief. You know, once we were discussing about this. Uh, I mean, corridor project with him. I told what this is, yeah, we are not talking about a Mudumale Mukurki corridor. It is a very, very important corridor because it's the only landscape where, you know, one end we have these uh, uh, animals like blackbuck and four on antelope, you know, connected to the Nilgiri, so where you have the Nilgiri tar. And elephants still use that area. I mean, uh, you should, uh, you said, sir, it's not included in our report so far. When you do a survey and report that, uh, possibly you'll be able to uh, think about that corridor also. So another corridor also, also, I should tell him, you know, between the superior landscape and Agastimali landscape. And um, he said, you know, that also we need to work on it. And uh, because the elephants come up to the Chagota road, actually, they don't cross the road going into the uh, southern part of the road, actually. Uh, he said, after we do a survey, you know, possibly you'll be able to, I mean, uh, you know, talk about them and make efforts to establish the corridor. So these were the, some of the you know, discussions I had with him about the corridor and I found him to be a very simple, uh, very nice uh, human being. So I was really, really shocked, you know, when I came to know that morning, you know, that uh, he died of COVID. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I suppose I can go now. Um, so thank you, uh, Varma and uh, Naveen and uh, Anusha and others, the Friends of Elephant, to have brought this uh, session together. Um, a somber session to, to remember two friends. Um, so uh, Ajay, you have heard about his early career uh, and, and, and later on from both Dr. John Singh and Dr. Sukumar. Uh, I actually never worked with him in India in the field. I bonded with him outside. Although within India, I was very much part of the whole Gaja task force and he and I uh, did write one chapter together and I wrote a few others as well for that. But outside India, my first listing was, uh, I, had, I had three, three uh, trips with him, uh, two very long, uh, I mean longish ones and one short one. Uh, but I just want to quickly recollect two or three instances, and that may tell you something about the person. Uh, my longest trip with him was in Sri Lanka, actually. And uh, that was when uh, he was engaged in driving back uh, elephants out of Anuradhapura uh, to, to wherever they, they were supposed to go. Uh, I think I saw somebody from Sri Lanka also in the... In the uh, attendees today. I don't know whether it's Vijay Mohan or somebody else. So I don't know who, who else was there. Um, and I had gone there for completely different reasons. I was investigating the ivory trade uh, in, in Sri Lanka. But uh, he wanted me along uh, and we spent uh, a week or 10 days or maybe two weeks uh, trying to estimate the number of elephants in a patch in Anuradhapura and driving it out. Ajay was an extremely practical field person. So his idea was to roll up his sleeves and get in there and walk. And Sri Lanka had, has in, in that particular patch that we were doing, we, it was very short vegetation, no trees. 
but enough short vegetation to, to, to make you stumble when elephants charge. Our job was to get into a herd of elephants and tranquilize uh, whichever one we wanted, uh, which was, Ajay had already noted all those things down and chosen his uh, animals for column before the drive start. But the Sri Lankan uh, guards who were there who were actually uh, tranquilizing the animals, being foreign experts, we were not allowed to handle it. Um, at that stage, this was one of the first times I think they were doing it, at least in that area. And they were not at all comfortable about going into a, into a herd like this and tranquilize. So they would try their level best to get out of it. And uh, there were many religious ceremonies which were performed. And Ajay was very, very, you know, uh, impatient. He wanted the thing done. Uh, the day would be slipping by while, while, uh, while uh, the team were propitiating the gods. Once they went in and, and tranquilized, and at least one particular person I remember, used to shoot and run. But the moment he ran, the elephant herd would also panic. And Ajay had repeatedly trained this guy uh, to shoot and sit, and he wouldn't. And I, I, can, I can vividly remember that thing of this man shooting and then running, and Ajay holding him by the shoulders and pushing him down. So it was like a cartoon thing. You know, his, this chap's legs were still going as he was running. Ajay uh, was still trying to push him down. Um, just a, a lighter moment, but we had lots of fun in that area. And we thought there were uh, 30, 40, 50 elephants, but 200 or 250 came out the other end when the drive started. So it, it was a, a learning experience and we bonded a lot. And as, as a uh, favor back to me for helping him out in his assi assignment, he came and helped me with my assignment by being undercover in ivory uh, operations. So, um, I mean, it was, it was a fantastic month or so that we spent in Sri Lanka together. Then I met him briefly in Cambodia and Laos where he was looking for the Kupri. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is that people may forget things like that, that Ajay did. Uh, the Kupri, the large, uh, large um, uh, bovine which went extinct in that area. Uh, there were still some reports of it in those days. And Ajay was part of a team with Will, Will Duckworth and others who were out searching for it. They didn't find it but we did cross paths uh, in, in Laos, uh, particularly in Laos and sometimes in Cambodia. And lastly, after I assumed charge of the uh, uh, Asian Elephant Specialist Group, which I took over from him um, and Simon Hedges, uh, I had put him on this working group for uh, Vietnam and the Vietnamese government had called us and we both went there to address a, a, a meeting and in Yok Don Park, uh, we wanted to visit the park, not just have the meeting. And they came with little pink scooters to take us on the back to go into the park. And both Ajay and I immediately said, no, why do we need scooter? We'll walk. And they just didn't want us to walk. But we insisted. And with one more person from WWF, we were the only three people who went in and walked. Uh, and walked a few days, two, two or three days. We walked deep into the park. Didn't see any elephants, saw plenty of uh, evidences. But again, uh, that practical side of him of wanting to go out and, and do things on foot in the forest, which very much uh, you know, was similar to me. I, I, you can't keep me in, in, a, in a forest without walking in the forest. Uh, I mean, we really bonded on that. Uh, his, his blunt, uncompromising manner came forth in the whole Gajar Task Force uh, report where he would speak his mind, uh, which is probably why Dr. Johnson, you said Jaram Ramesh remembers him because uh, while others were being diplomatic, Ajay would just uh, speak his mind. Yeah. Ram Kumar worked with me for 13 years. He passed away uh, on the anniversary of, of that, uh, of his joining, on the same day that he joined, uh, 13 years. And Ram Kumar came from a very, very small uh, village, which I didn't even know existed, although I was also born in Tamil Nadu, but I didn't even know. It was such a small village and had a very uh, humble background uh, and did all these things that you have heard about in the, in the uh, uh, introduction. He was absolutely critical in GPS mapping, especially the Southern Corridors, but he also helped in the entire first edition of Rite of Passage. Um, while Sandeep, who's also present today, uh, did a lot of that text and Sukumar and I, you know, we all wrote some parts, Dr. Johnson wrote some parts, but uh, Ram Kumar handled the maps for that. And even when we re-brought it out, he was part of that team which did the maps. He was again as un uncompromising as Ajay. So there are many things similar to, them. I don't know about the Tuskers in the room again, like Sukumar said, uh, these two were maknas. 
in the field, both Ajay and Ramkumar. They came from small, humble backgrounds. They were both walkers and they were both blunt uh, to the point of being uncompromising. Uh, I was telling even my staff in his, uh, in his memorial meeting that I disagreed with him violently on, on some things because he was an idealist. Uh, slightly different from Ajay in that. Slightly different from Ajay in that, but uh, possibly that's because Ajay was 20 years old. Uh, Ram Kumar was still wanting vast stretches of land for the elephant. And he would put the, the corridor boards of the Wildlife Trust of India and the state government in places perhaps sometimes a few hundred meters away from the corridor. And when I would look at the map and say, no, Ram Kumar, you have to place it here. He wouldn't do it. He would give me some excuse or the other. So I, I used to get annoyed with him for not doing it. But he would say that, sir, if I placed it here, somebody will come and take that land also. Let us keep that for elephant. So although it was really not a legal part or we didn't want it legally, but he would like to get a little bit more for the elephant as much as possible. I used to joke with him that, you know, if, if you start giving land away like this, you will take Uti and Coimbatore and give it to the elephants. He probably wanted to give most of Coimbatore to the elephants. Mm -hmm. We used to keep talking about the Kalla Corridor and we have visited several times. Dr. Johnson, you mentioned about the Agastamali Corridor. He has mentioned it to me and, and we had decided that he would go and ground truth it. And, you know, and after that, we can add it to the new edition. So he was very much involved in that. So both uncompromising people, uh, both people who worked very hard uh, and both both people who came from small town backgrounds, who didn't have the polish of a convent educated, uh, Delhi educated or Bombay educated person, uh, but uh, I think did more for elephants in their own way. Uh, Ajay by his studies and Ram Kumar by his uh, corridor mapping. I think both of them will be remembered uh, for that for a long time. That's all I have to say. Uh, I pay homage to the departed souls. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing your memories. Indeed, their contribution is indispensable and the loss is irreplaceable. Thank you very much. We would like, now like to move on to the next part of the session. Thanks, Naveen. Right. As stated, we now move on to um, our next part, which is conversation by Dr. Arun Ram Venkatraman in with the, our guests. The topic being Indian experiences on Asian elephant conservation. Thank I would you. now like to introduce all of our uh, guests and experts. I begin with Professor Sukumar. Mm -hmm. Anusha, do you need to do this? We've, we've already spoken, and I think people are. I, 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 all the of only our, reason I uh, said is uh, the people in the chat are wanting to hear about elephants, and they've been saying that they are impatient to hear about elephants. But you can do a shorter version. Perhaps. Thank you. Sure, sir. I'll I'll try to make it a quicker version. Please bear with me because I would like to introduce all of the guests to our participants. Uh, Dr. Sukumar is honorary professor at the Center of Ecological uh, Studies, IASC. Uh, his areas of interest are wildlife ecology, uh, tropical forest ecology, and climate change. Uh, Professor Sukumar has authored four books on elephants and uh, around 200 scholarly uh, publications in the area of elephant biology, climate change, and nature conservation. He has also been uh, part of numerous advisory boards and committees, as you can see. And he has received numerous awards and recognition for his work, like on Asian elephants, like the Whitley Gold Award and Order of the Golden ARK, amongst others. Apologies for cutting it short um, upon request of men and sir. Uh, Dr. ATJ John Singh, he is one of India's leading naturalists and field biologists. Sir has served for almost 20 years, retired in 2005 as Dean Faculty of Wildlife Sciences from Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. He is currently associated with Nature Conservation Foundation, WWF India and Corbett Foundation. He has represented uh, as a standing committee on National Board for uh, Wildlife, National Tiger Conservation Authority and Uttarakhand State Wildlife Board. Sir has also authored several uh, books and articles and has also been the senior editor 
uh, and has published two volumes of Mammal of South Asia. He has also been awarded the Distinguished uh, Service Award by Society for Conservation Biology, Kalzai's uh, Wildlife Conservation Award, the ABN AMRO Sanctuary Lifetime Wildlife Service Award, amongst the others. We quickly move on to the introduction of our other guests. Vivek Menon, sir, he's the uh, founder, executive director, and CEO of Wildlife Trust of India and a leading Indian wildlife conservationist. He's currently the chair of IUCN SSC, and he serves on a number of governmental as well as non-governmental boards, committees. He was also the member of the Elephant Task Force of MOEF and who has suggested a complete revamp of uh, the elephant conservation strategy in India. Sir is the author of 10 wildlife books, including best-selling Indian Mammals, A Field Guide. He is also the recipient of numerous awards, including the Whitley and the Clark R. Bhavan Awards for his work to conserve Asian elephant. Lastly, uh, Dr. Arun Mekar Traman. Uh, Dr. Arun is technical director at ERM, which is a global sustainability consultancy. He has his PhD in ecological sciences and has about 35 years of experiences working for academic as well as conservation organizations. At ERM, uh, Dr. Arun leads and advises biodiversity initiatives with emphasis on assessing and managing impacts on threatened, endemic, restricted range and migratory or congregatory species. He has extensive conservation and research experience in Bangla Bangladesh, Bhutan, Gabon, India, Nepal, Malaysia, and he has also authored several scientific papers, book chapters, popular articles, and scientific reports. I would now request um, Dr. Arun to kindly take the conversation forward. Uh, good evening to everybody. And uh, apologies for sitting in somewhat darkness here. Uh, my family is actually watching an RD Burman program, online RD Burman program in the other room. So. Um, Apologies if there is some background noise. I've tried to get them to um, be as soft as possible, but occasionally you will get these, uh, uh, you know, noises coming in. So apologies for that. So, um, you know, I, um, there were uh, two main reasons why I um, accepted this offer to uh, get into conversations with uh, the speakers today. One is that all three speakers are imminently known to me. I mean, uh, Dr. John Singh, uh, Professor Sukumar, Vivek, I've worked with all of them at uh, some phase in my career, enjoyed myself and uh, really, um, um, you know, um, I think I respect them as uh, doings of wildlife conservation in this country. Uh, so it's been my, it's a very uh, a pleasure to, it's a big pleasure to actually uh, um, have these uh, conversations with them uh, uh, this evening. And secondly, uh, Ajay and Ram Kumar. Ajay, of course, I've known for almost as long as I have been in wildlife conservation uh, as a career and um, uh, many stories to share about him, which uh, unfortunately we don't have the time tonight. And Ram Kumar, more recently, you know, I have been working with him on the um, Right to Passage on the second edition. And, it, you know, I've had interacted with him on um, several occasions and admired his passion, his uh, commitment, his, uh, you know, diligence and uh, um, uh, really planning for the securing of uh, these elephant corridors. It's a, it's a real, uh, I think, a masterpiece uh, work and people like Ram Kumar, young people like Ram Kumar have really contributed to making it a benchmark um, uh, effort. Um, so I, I actually have a, you know, I, I, I don't know who will kind of answer this question, uh, but uh, I have uh, uh, maybe two questions really in uh, this um, um, uh, event. Uh, one is that, um, you know, I actually work uh, for a sustainability consultancy and today I have seen the changing world of conservation. Um, it may not actually uh, ch have changed everywhere, but with respect to global pressures or globe, global influences, there is so much emphasis on embedding um, biodiversity conservation with uh, climate change, you know, having uh, governments and um, um, uh, uh, private companies uh, achieving climate change targets, but keeping in mind 
you know, biodiversity and ecosystem services benefits as well as uh, societal benefits. Um, this is really a, a game changing uh, kind of uh, uh, period right now. And, um, uh, you know, um, one really needs to think very strongly about the role of more traditional, more conventional, but equally important uh, wildlife biology in this changing paradigm. So I just go back to, you know, somebody like Ajay Desai and, uh, you know, I think it has been um, very uh, eloquently expressed about his mentoring role for younger students, particularly coming from smaller uh, towns. Uh, and one example, of course, I always uh, think about is ABC College in um, uh, Mylar Dure, where which produced uh, several, I think, very, very important young uh, wildlife biologists. Uh, many of them are still working um, somewhat in the background of uh, conservation, but quite a few of them have actually, uh, uh, you know, risen up to fairly leading roles. And uh, if you actually look at many of them, in fact, a majority of them, they would have somehow come in Ajay's influence in one way or the other. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of get into naming people um, uh, right now, but uh, there are several probably even on this call who have uh, come under Ajay's sphere of influence. Now, my real question is number one, um, you know, do we still have these kind of mentors out there, you know, mentoring younger people, uh, recognizing some kind of intrinsic love for uh, uh, nature and wildlife conservation, building upon that by training them in more, um, um, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, more um, uh, state of art scientific techniques, and really kind of getting them through some of the major challenges in life, like producing a master's thesis or a PhD thesis. And all, a lot of this is actually not based on a knowledge of global policy or, you know, um, um, uh, uh, national uh, legislation. A lot of this is based in very uh, hardcore, I think, um, uh, you know, grassroots uh, field biology and field craft, which has really actually produced some very outstanding results in terms of, for example, understanding uh, uh, elephants and their ranging patterns. Uh, in landscapes such as the Nilgiris. I mean, a lot of this work, I mean, you know, later on, it of course moved to something more sophisticated like radio telemetry. But, um, you know, I think the, uh, the, the groundwork for that was based on very traditional field biology. You know, first of all, understanding habitats, they are, you know, kind of identifying problems uh, such as uh, uh, problems in habitat utilization, problems in um, uh, root causes for uh, elephant human conflict, and then finally, coming down to things like, you know, planning for securing of corridors, etc. A lot of that actually had its roots in very traditional field biology, which fortunately, I think all of us have done at some stage in our life. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, particularly Professor Sukumar and uh, uh, Dr. John Singh, I mean, I think, uh, 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 you know, their early years have been spent in the wild understanding elephants, uh, just like Ajay. And... Um, my, my worry is that, you know, with more, I would say, um, um, attractive kind of options available today. Like, you know, a good example is the way companies are actually investing in ESG finance, you know, which still requires wildlife biologists, which requires biodiversity understanding, et cetera. But there may be a shift away from, you know, the more traditional wildlife biology to something which is big ticket, is certainly kind of uh, important with respect to changing how the world looks at biodiversity loss or climate change issues. But, you know, in the end, are we losing some of those skills uh, simply by people not getting into them? And more importantly, by the lack of mentors like, such as Ajay Desai. So I open this question to the panel on, you know, uh, first of all, are we changing, facing a changing paradigm in the way we do a conservation? And secondly, um, uh, what do we need to kind of ensure that that more conventional wildlife biology continues uh, forever? You know, because as I said, I think it's still vital uh, for any conservation planning that uh, we have that knowledge. I, I open it up, you know, maybe uh, from, uh, Dr. Johnson, you want to go uh, uh, make the first comment. Then we go once again, as Vivek suggests, uh, by seniority, then with Professor Sukumar and then uh, Vivek. 
Dr. Johnson? It's a very, very pertinent question, Arun. I mean, I, you did the summary very beautifully. Yeah. But if you want to become a model to others, you know, you should have the knowledge like Ajay Desai had. Like yeah. our uh, Vivek Menon was telling that uh, experience or that uh, inter incident which happened in Sri Lanka, where because of his Ajay's, I mean, uh, uh, excellent knowledge about wild elephants in Dutumalai. Uh, and he could uh, convince the Sri Lankan people, you know, about the best way of uh, going and hunting these animals, actually. So without that, uh, I mean, what you call, I mean, excellent, time-tested field knowledge, you can't become a model. I think that is one thing I find it lacking in uh, in our country now. Many people, and as I rightly said, you know, they're very happy with, the, I mean, um, electric survey and uh, computer work and so on, GAs and so on, based on that, they try to manage conservation. I mean, it can't be done. People need to have amazing field knowledge, time-tested field knowledge, uh, then only then they'll be able to do conservation. So, I mean, it, it doesn't come uh, overnight, actually. One has to spend quite a lot of time in the field, you know, walking and understanding, staying there, uh, talking to the tribals, talking to the forest guards, acquiring the knowledge, and uh, then passing on to the people. Then only that the people will start following. And you can become a model, actually. So there, I think we lack very woefully in our country. And I think I have answered part of your uh, question, I think. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. John Singh. Professor Sukumar, any comments on my well, yeah, I'll, support? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll take it. I'll take it where John Singh has left it. Uh, let me talk about the science part of, uh, of uh, conservation. You know? I think obviously all of us uh, realize the need for uh, routing conservation decisions on science. You know? the, by science, I mean not just uh, biological sciences, ecological sciences, but eventually also social sciences. You know? It's a very, very important component. Now, if you look at the development of uh, conservation science or wildlife biology in the country, I mean, in the early days, it was uh, largely confined to you know, some of the more spectacular larger mammals and maybe some birds and so on, you know, with the BNHs out there and some of us, you know, doing uh, uh, some of the early work on some of the larger mammals. But today, if you ask me, the science has developed considerably. Uh, it has gone far beyond, uh, you know, whatever uh, natural history kind of uh, knowledge, uh, you know, however good that is, you know, people like John Singh and myself and all that we did, uh, you know, John Singh to, of course, far, far, you know, a superior extent, and some of us, what we had picked up uh, in the field, you know, the use of modern scientific tools has changed our, uh, uh, you know, our knowledge about the biology of species, you know. Uh, it can be about uh, social organizations, it can be about genetics, it can be about animal physiology, it can be about, uh, you know, uh, 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 stuff like, uh, you know, home ranges, you know, over, over in, the, in the longer term, what actually happens you know, at the end of the day, you also need the tools like computers to do modeling of uh, elephant demography, elephant uh, population dynamics, all of which have a bearing on, uh, you know, our conservation policy. And in that respect, I would say that in the last 30, 40 years, there has been a remarkable expansion. Uh, there are a whole lot of young, you know, younger generation, not just on mammals and birds, but it's spread across natural history in India. I mean, there are people doing path-breaking work on, you know, insect behavior, social biology, you know, reptilian, amphibian, fishes, you know, the whole, whole gamut of all of this. Where I see the real challenge is that, that then that information, the interface of that with conservation policy. I think here's where, to a large extent, uh, there is a bit of a gap, you know. You still have a lot of people who are good, excellent field workers, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, you have people who are very good in terms of their science. And I think a, a proper meeting or synergy of the two interacting with policymakers, administrators, you know, what by that I mean forest departments, you know, environment ministry and so on. I'm in a meeting. I'm in the hour. But there are a very large number of, uh, I mean, from the science point of view, of mentors today who can, I mean, just uh, just look at the kind of publications coming out from India, you know, high, very high quality publications on, you know, all different taxa, you know, it's about all, all different animal groups, you know, it's not just the mammals or the birds. It's been fantastic development in the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Professor Sukumar, on that very positive note. And, um, you know, uh, uh, 
I, I think there's a lot of points you make which are very, very valid, but I'll just pass it on to Vivek for his opinion because... Uh, yeah, but, well, nothing long to say because both uh, Dr. John Singh and Sukmar has said uh, what really has to be said. I, I agree with quite a bit of it. I mean, what, what you just uh, I mean, put us to task on, which is that is uh, basic wildlife uh, biology in the field important? Of course it is. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no question about it. Uh, we, we are remembering people who did that. Just the corridor instance, right? Just the corridor instance. A number of Western academics, and I don't see too many on uh, among the participants here, uh, but a number of Western academics would have done the whole corridor ex exercise based on GIS, yeah, based on a connectivity model of uh, <clears throat> where the habitats uh, are linking and uh, you know come out of the map. Uh, and I remember when you first published write a passage uh, when I was when I was presenting it abroad. Uh, at, a, at a couple of uh, locations, people cross questioned me as to how we, what was the science uh, between uh, in, in, in inferring that these are elephant corridors? Or are you thinking of creating elephant corridors? You know, um, so of course, we were not creating elephant corridors, we were mapping the corridors that elephants use. So, um, in, in my normal manner, I, I told them that uh, it's very simple. We do it using very good science, which is that we put a person at the end of an elephant and wherever the elephant shits, uh, we follow the elephant, and as you walk, and as you as you as you see the trail of dung uh, over a period of time, you can then use that to infer where the elephant moves, and then you try to infer uh, connectivity uh, using GIS by overlaying it on that to see which elephant movement should not be taken as corridors and which elephant movement should be taken as corridors. But it is not a purely academic exercise sitting in a, a lab in 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 the US or Europe uh, looking only at GIS. It does involve that basic groundwork. I also agree with Sukumar 100%. I think the youngsters today actually are coming back to uh, uh, to walking the field. And uh, and happily, not only with elephants. They're walking the field for dragonflies and frogs and you know all sorts of things. And, and things that we didn't know existed, we are coming to know because they are walking the field. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in the future. This thing that all the golden years are gone and only we walked and nobody else did is not entirely true. It may be true in certain uh, sets and circumstances. I would think that the, the forest officer, by and large, is uh, getting desk bound uh, or, or getting vehicle bound. Desk bound is the wrong word. Uh, they do, they are inside, but vehicle bound. Uh, but the new set of naturalist NGOs uh, are actually walking the field. So we have got some reason to hope as well. Arun, you have to unmute. You have to unmute, Arun. Yeah. Thanks, Vivek, for uh, uh, reminding us about uh, uh, the um, persistence of uh, wildlife biology and Sukumar talking about the real advances we made in science. Um, we made in wildlife sciences. Um, I have a somewhat linked question to this. Um, uh, and uh, it really goes back uh, and I, I think three of you are the, probably the best people to ask this question. Um, it goes back to my understanding about conservation planning. Now, let's say, let's take tigers, okay? Um, and many of our assessments we have actually seen. I, I thought this really was only about elephants. Careful. <laughs> I this was only oh, well, I'll come to elephants soon. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll, I, I, yeah, I, I will keep uh, this example of tigers as brief as possible. But, you know, the whole... Um, uh, paradigm of camera trapping, identifying tigers, you know, f figuring out where they're moving. In many cases, using genetic studies to like look at distances they have dispersed. Um, uh, you know, this whole concept of source and sink, you know, project tiger reserves, which are sources simply because uh, the carrying capacities of tigers has, have been crossed and, um, you know, sinks where there are relatively fewer tigers and thinking about like linkages, ecological linkages between sources and sinks. I think it's advanced quite a lot. And um, many of you have actually played a very, very important role in this. And um, once again, you know, um, elephants, coming back to elephants, I, I still remember many, many years ago, uh, we published a, a report called a JSD, a database of uh, Southern Indian elephant reserves. Um, this was almost nearly 20 years ago. And 
it, it was a you know somewhat an amateurish uh, uh, attempt but i think it was a pioneering attempt but what was interesting was that and the whole point of that report was to really give uh, um, um, state governments decision making rules on when they ask for money from the central government about what project elephant reserves really need you know uh, is it habitat are there issues about elephant human conflict that need to be res resolved is it population monitoring and the point of the report was to kind of try and uh, uh, indicate or advise state governments on you know what the elephant conservation priorities are what numbers are like where are your elephants etc and you know one of the successes i saw in that um, producing that report which re was retained for several years is that forest departments used to cut and paste that report into uh, management plans and um, proposals to project elephant etc which you know typically people would have been concerned about but we thought it good i mean at least some you know, at, at that stage whatever science we had about elephant uh, ecology was actually getting uh, pasted into government uh, documents now <clears throat> of course um, you know with uh, the um, right to passage uh, the first and the second edition um and i have also noticed uh, that you know if you uh, there, there is any development to happen in um, uh, close to an elephant corridor or on an elephant corridor the uh, elephant corridor is actually identified based on that and uh, you know it looks like almost some quasi official um, um, uh, uh, policy or rather not policy but management plan about elephant uh, corridors within the state so they quote that the question is you know how legal is that uh, identification of elephant corridors in some cases cases they have been gazetted and many cases they have not but in in um, at least you know half a dozen cases i know uh, the corridors identified in that uh, volume actually are used to uh, query a development process in terms of uh, habitat fragmentation in terms of management planning etc which i think you know is somewhat embedding conservation science into um, policy making so the question is you know once again to the three of you and we'll follow the same order of seniority uh, how effective do you think that is and uh, i think sukumar already kind of commented on that a little earlier but perhaps you know he can elaborate on that uh, a little more but you know dr johnson uh, you know have we really moved from the days where um conservation policy and science were completely disjunct and uh, didn't really talk to each other or we seeing a much better world uh, or a much better india today where you know the the kind of um, um, uh, uh, interface between uh, wildlife science and conservation policy is a lot better and you know once again both ajay desai i i, I was uh, prompted to ask this question simply looking at all the advisory committees that ajay this i sat on bringing his uh, vast knowledge about elephants into conservation planning so oh, dr johnson over to you here oh vivek you want to do the other way around here yeah, for no, just no, let's, let's <laughs> just just a change yeah. i'm 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 busy answering the chat the queries on the chat so okay. why, yeah, yeah. dr johnson dr. Yeah, yeah yeah a whole lot of that you know the major problem in our country is yeah we come up with excellent recommendation but it takes a long time to implement them if at all they are implemented yeah. like we we can i know about this uh, chillamuti sir corridor we wrote about it 30 years ago i would say yeah. that is one of the simplest corridors we have in the country you know they would have built a flyover between mm -hmm. raiwal and haridwar long time ago they should have shifted to the army ammunition dump they carried them out they should have been uh, translocated I mean, the period the mouse is has gone. Now, now only they are in the process of completing the flyover, which in those days I suggested it should be for one kilometer long. Now I, they cut down to some seven hundred, eight hundred meters and so on. Army ammunition army is not going. Is I mean, they are they are not willing to move out of that area. So I mean, I'm quoting this as in one example. I mean, it's a very important corridor connecting two halves of the wildlife habitat on both the banks of, I mean, uh, Ganges River actually. But we have taken more than 30 years. Still, it is not a functional actually. Okay, so this is the problem we see in our country. We come up with excellent recommendations that are not respected. And like you know, you take that you know 
Kuno, where they wanted to bring the second population of lions. The Supreme Court gave the directive the lion should be brought within six months, 1913. It was not respected. So, the, you know, that type of problems are there. But like uh, Vivek Menon said, you know, now because of camera trapping and a lot of, lot of, I mean, uh, youngsters, you know, they're interested in uh, uh, photography with excellent cameras, you know, they tend to go into the forest and take amazing pictures. So amazing pictures are brought down by this, brought out by this, uh, I mean, young naturalist. That's one thing, camera trapping has brought out amazing information. You know, today there was one uh, uh, news item, you know, the mother tigress died and the, the male male tiger is taking care of four, uh, I mean, uh, some of Durana cubs in Panna tigers actually. Such things, you know, not have been possible some decades ago, now because of the camera trap, these are possible actually. But uh, I mean, a lot of things, you know, like Aja report also, if you see many things, you know, excellent suggestions are there. Are we able to implement them in the country? Whether the country is giving enough importance such to such, uh, I mean, uh, proposals and ideas and uh, findings. That is my point, actually. Thank you, Arun. Thanks, uh, Dr. John Singh. Uh, Professor Sukumar, your take on that uh, question of our mind? Yeah, I'll, uh, I don't know. I'll probably speak out my mind on a few issues. Yeah. The first is that uh, I think uh, one is that uh, there is, uh, you know, this is, I've always said this, that there is always a 20 year time lag, of, you know, by the time a new idea is put out. And by the time, uh, you know, in general, you know, society at large, government, policy, et cetera, et cetera, it starts you know, uh, catching their attention. So this is a constant of a, almost like a 20 year gap I found uh, over, the, over the past 40 years that I've been involved in natural history uh, studies and conservation and everything. The second point is, I think, so we all say conservation, conservation, conservation. It's not just about how much conservation, but also how conservation is achieved. And that's extremely important in a country like India, where by and large, the agendas are largely uh, driven by people living in cities. Uh, like most of us, and uh, by what is perceived as a kind of a more of a social elite. And it does not take people's participation, the people on the ground who are sharing habitat with elephants and tigers and all the rest of it, and who eventually pay the cost for conservation. Okay, this is something that, um, you know, all of our um, uh, social media, you know, a lot of articles that come out uh, about uh, whatever, you know, about elephant conservation or tigers or whatever, I think is completely insensitive to the needs of people who are not to blame. It's like somebody is there near the forest area, you know, they are to blame, you know, they are encroachers, they are this, they are that, et cetera, et cetera. I think we need to have a complete change in our mindset and only then we can so solve conservation problems and issues. We are a country of 1.3 billion people. Okay, let's not forget it, 1.4 or what, whatever it is. We have to live with that fact. The land to people ratio in our country is much, much smaller than let's say Canada. And let's not forget, that if you look at per capita emissions of carbon, which is causing all these problems, you know, an average Canadian or an average American is letting out 10 times as much greenhouse gases as an average Indian is overall. Okay, let's keep that, uh, you know, very, very strongly in the back of your uh, minds. The second thing is that I'll come back again, you know, because Gaja and all these were mentioned, I'll come back to the Karnataka Elephant Task Force report. Okay, we gave a very, very practical and uh, pragmatic outline of how conservation should be achieved. It's not just about Karnataka. It's about, this is a model for India as a whole. We are talking about elephant conservation zones. Okay, I'll just take one example. You know, we said there has to be a zonation when it comes to elephant. There has to be an elephant conservation zone, primarily of intact forest areas, national parks, where there are by and large no people intact. And those are the areas which are elephant conservation zones. Very large areas in Karnataka, other parts of the country. The second we said was that, you know, if you look at it in the landscape scale, there will be settlements. You know, these are all historical contingencies that we have evolved over thousands of years. You know, let's not forget that human, modern humans came into India 65,000 years ago. Okay. And we have, and they have colonized India. You know, it's not just that, you know, people who are living in a forest area are, uh, have no right to be there. And all of us who are created the cities, I have every right to live where we have, you know, and so on. Uh, they are there. Therefore, there is an interface. So we have to have a conservation, uh, an elephant-human interface zone where you have to manage conflicts very, very actively. All right. But then we stuck our neck out. So this is uh, 
myself, uh, Ajay Desai, uh, Madhusudan, Mr. S.S. Bist, Mr. Ajay Mishra, uh, uh, Chandra Lele, and so on, where we said elephant removal zone, no go zone for the elephant. But what I'm finding today, and I'm, I'm really appalled by this, and I'm speaking out my mind, because, you know, the social media and everything is that allow elephants to go wherever they want to go. You know, there is a kind of a very, very kind of a fuzziness and a concept that has unfortunately descended, and you cannot solve conservation problems, you cannot solve conflicts. You can take it from me. 20 years from now, people will be debating the same thing over and over, over and over again. How do you solve conflict? You will not, you will not solve conflict. You cannot uh, create fictitious corridors wherever elephants are going to. Elephants went to Mysore, uh, killed uh, somebody an ATM, you know, uh, to guard, uh, guard uh, at an ATM machine. It's not a corridor, and so on. I can give all kinds of other examples. So we have to be very practical, very pragmatic, and then you can solve problems. But the situation is already getting out of hand for elephants. So the then a whole, whole lot of other challenges are coming. Climate change, you know. Corridors are not just for uh, uh, for elephants and for tigers. You know, yes, I mean these are symbolic. These are icons that we use, and some of these that we created in the past. The GIS report that you mentioned, the 1998, it was 1998 around that we brought out the GIS database for elephants. So this formed the basis for Project Elephant, the first Project Elephant document that came out. You know, all this came out of that. We have to play. You know, climate change now poses a whole lot of other issues and challenges. Forget about everything else. The heat is on. You saw the leaked report of the IPCC that BBC and CNN and all that have been playing just two or three days ago. That report should not have been leaked, but it has been leaked. You know, I've been part of IPCC for 30 years now. The heat is really on on this planet Earth. And those are the problems that had to be first solved. Our elephant population has done pretty well under the circumstances in the last 40 years. The populations have gone up. The ranges have expanded significantly. We need to move towards landscape scale, sensible landscape scale planning for conservation. That means a host of plant and animal species will have to migrate. And they're already migrating. Over the past 100 years, herbaceous plants in the Himalaya and the Sikkim region have migrated. We know from you know, uh, uh, you know, earlier historical accounts and present. Species are going to migrate and disperse and, to be, and they have to establish. They can do that through sensible landscape planning is what this should be the new paradigm where people are uh, respected and uh, you know participants and they are incentivized to participate to maintain biodiversity friendly land use put your money on the table put your money where your mouth is and then talk about conservation that's all that's going to work you know we've got huge amounts of money thousands tens of thousands of crores under campa we need a complete paradigm shift i mean i've been in the national in the old indian board for wildlife i've been in the national board for wildlife Many of our PAs and our boundaries were all drawn, you know, uh, arbitrarily and wrongly in the past. You know, there has to be a rationalization of those boundaries. They have to be integrated at landscape scale so that all species are able to adapt effectively to climate change. You know, not just the elephant or the tiger. But that also means drawing the line, mind you. There are lines that have to be drawn. And uh, in terms of our active management of species, so that you reduce the sufferings of people, not just human deaths, Humongous millions of hours of man hours spent in the night guarding their fields. You know, I mean, don't we, don't, don't, don't we have a heart for any of this? Okay, conservation cannot be solved in the country. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Sukumar. I think that was a very deep dive into some of the root causes of our policy issues. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the organizers of this, um, 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 not this, uh, uh, organizers, but the facilitators of this discussion. Uh, uh, I would like to actually remind them that this is another very useful topic for discussion in the future. So hopefully you will kind of uh, note that down and we can uh, have another talk uh, one weekend on uh, some of these issues that um, uh, uh, Professor Sukumar very eruditely kind of uh, touched upon. Vivek? Uh, I, 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 I can pass that if you want, uh, if, if your time is slipping by. Uh, well, no. A few quick words would be because this is, I think, a very, very important. Okay, so, well, well, few quick words, very simple. Um, I mean, no, no doubt landscape planning is uh, the way out and it's nothing new. We've, we've been saying this for many years. I think Dr. Johnson talked about Chilam Motichu for 30 years. Uh, the, the sadness about some of these things is that we know this, like Dr. Johnson has been talking about this for, for innumerable years and, and mapping it and knowing exactly where the elephants cross. And then... <clears throat> 
if, if from our side, from my left side of India, we actually relocated a whole village, Khandgautri. It took us 10 years, but we relocated a whole village. <clears throat> and yet what the government needs to do in Uttarakhand, they're not doing. So he talked about a couple of things that they should do. So even, even local people have moved out. But if after that, you cannot uh, get the army ammunition dump uh, to move and or uh, you know, the, uh, the, the flyovers to come up properly, then it is a great waste of uh, tragedy. People have been asking about the Coimbatore area uh, in, in the chats uh, without going into detail. But for, for example, the train accidents between Palghat and Coimbatore. Yeah? I mean, uh, the railways had asked WTA to make a on-ground survey, and we did it for four years, including Ram Kumar worked on it. Right? Detailed maps were put, not maps as a map of corridor, but maps between poles, pole number 255 to pole number 256. What are the things to be done? Yeah, Where should it be barricaded? Where should the elephants move? Root causes will not, will not work there. But still it has not happened. And when there's an accident, it's exactly the same spot. So that is sad when certain uh, you know, decisions are not taken. In this case, an interstate issue. I think. If Tamil Nadu does something, Kerala doesn't do it, reciprocate or the other. So if, if, um, if uh, decisions are not taken despite good science, then, then we are saying that good science is not uh, percolating. But there are also good, uh, good examples where it has worked. So slowly, slowly, catchy monkey, I suppose. Conservation is all about that. You have to have patience. Um, you know, uh, conservation, I keep saying, is not the science of the impossible. It's the art of the possible. And where it is not possible, we have to make it possible. But it takes time. With those uh, uh, very uh, uh, thoughtful words, uh, Vivek, I'll end this session and hand it back uh, to uh, the Friends of Elephant, uh, Elephants for continuing um, the proceedings. Thanks and good night. And uh, wonderful talking to all of you. Hope we can actually meet physically soon and continue these discussions. Thanks. Sir. Anusha, over to you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I guess we have a lot of questions that are pouring in. So I would request Sanjay to uh, please take over and we can have the discussion continued with the questions. We've received a lot of questions and I also see uh, Dr. Menon has answered quite a few questions. Thank you, sir. Thanks for that. And for the ones that um, have not been answered, maybe we can quickly take up those uh, questions. Sanjay? Thank you so much, Anusha. I hope I'm audible, Anusha. You are, you are, Sanjay. Thank you. Lovely, lovely. Thank you so much. And uh, you, you already said I would like to thank uh, Mr. Menon again for answering most of the questions. Uh, but indeed, it was very exciting. I would uh, like to uh, thank you, Dr. Arun, uh, to actually pick up questions which uh, I would say cover most of the aspects which, which we are aware of. It's a very multidimensional topic. Uh, and I would like to, uh, you know, there is there are still some questions I would like to uh, pick up. I've gone with a very old way of writing it down. Uh, uh, let me start with the confession. Confession. I will not take a lot of time. I have a butterflies in my stomach because you know the the, the today's event name also says the pastors in the room. So uh, you know, so I, I'll go with that. And I would like to ask a question uh, which is open to everybody. Uh, and we, we talked about uh, various challenges. We, we talked about various technical aspects. Mr. Minnan already uh, replied on those technical aspects. I would like to ask a question uh, saying that, you know, considering the last uh, five decades, you know, post, post Wildlife Protection Act, what are those uh, two, three uh, achievements when it comes to elephant conservation, uh, which would set a different context altogether? And I, I keep it open to uh, anybody who would like to respond. I can say, I mean, Wildlife Protection Act, you know, puts elephants in Schedule 1. So that gives it the highest protection. And that has certainly helped. Uh, two things happened. First is that, uh, as I said, uh, systematic capture of elephants in large numbers stopped the protection. Okay. So that's the first one. Uh, otherwise, you could have had depleting populations, but the systematic capture. Okay. I'm not talking about, but I st still feel that captures are inevitable in the uh, in, uh, in the context of conflicts uh, presently, but there were very large scale captures that were going on, and the Wildlife Protection Act put an end to that. The whole issue of ivory poaching, if I can also speak about, but uh, some of my work in the 1980s actually brought out the real magnitude of the problem and good data were not available. 
And I was the first one to make estimates across the country of how many in the 1980s, how many elephants were being killed by every poachers each year. I mean, the in southern India. And that was uh, something like 100 to 150. Uh, I think uh, the Wildlife Protection Act and the wild, you know, uh, in, in general, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there was strengthening of the uh, uh, law and enforcement machinery over the years in the 80s and 90s. And after that, poaching of elephants for ivory has come down substantially. So the Wildlife Protection Act helped. But I'll just uh, give a contrary view. And that is the contrary view is that uh, the Wildlife Protection Act uh, largely talks about the individual protected areas. You know, the national parks are the Later on, we added the tiger reserve and all that. But the elephant project, uh, elephant, in which I had the privilege of being on the first task force that helped set up Project Elephant, way back in 1892, we brought in our landscape, the landscape concept for that at that stage. The concept of viable, the viability of populations, the viability of habitats and landscapes and so on. And that went beyond the Wildlife Protection Act in many, in many ways. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there and then perhaps others. Thanks. Sure, sure. Just uh, just to take it forward, you know, there's one question uh, which which has a, a, a similar, uh, you know, uh, I would say, uh, when we talk about the elephant population viability, you know, it talks about it's it's a little academic, but I would like to ask. Uh, it says that when it comes to Uttar Kannada, you know, there is a, there is a conflict issue, and uh, in view of getting connected to a larger population in Uttar Kannada and Karnataka uh, for avoiding inbreeding. Why can't we release captured individuals for increasing gene pool? It's very specific. It's not re-releasing them, but releasing for gene pool. Um, I don't know. Does anybody want to answer that? <laughs> or shall I go ahead and, and try to give you my thoughts on it? John Singh, you want to say something? You know, that the North Karnataka population, you know, it's a small one. It is at a vast habitat. But still, there are a lot of settlements and so on. And you know, periodically they emigrate into Maharashtra, where many of them die actually. I would say that is one factor which is keeping the population very small. If you look at the old records, you know, those populations were once connected to this Mysore population. But the one big reservoir, huge reservoir has come. I was told that is the one which has blocked the migratory path and so on. But the, I mean, leaving, uh, I mean, uh, captive elephants there and increase the gene pool may not be needed actually, uh, because we have wild elephants and you know, there are problem areas, we capture them and those elephants can be translocated and with the radio color and so on, we can monitor them and find out you know, whether those animals are able to survive there and so on. So one can make an attempt to take Wild elephants to that area to augment the population because it is a Anshi Tandeli tiger reserve, fairly large area, very good habitat actually, moist in the Sudas forest, very good for elephants. Um, but uh, there is uh, no need for taking captive elephants there. Captive elephants means you know they will run into human habitation and lead to more conflict. You know, uh, these are my point actually. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just add to what Dr. Johnson has said. All that I'll say is that uh, we have to be mindful of uh, increasing conflict. You know, I mean, right now you have something like between 50 and 100 elephants there, you know, which is biologically it's viable. And uh, rest of it, I think Johnson has answered. Sure. Thank you so much. So, <clears throat> uh, partly, uh, Mr. Menon has already addressed, uh, you know, a couple of questions which are which are to do with the uh, challenges that we, we are facing and uh, the learnings that we have for last uh, you know, four or five decades. Uh, so just to add into that in the next question I would like to ask, uh, when we have these new functions emerging like the social media, you know, there's a communication which is coming up. Okay? So uh, uh, this is just one uh, hypothetical example. So uh, what do you think that what could be such functions which would play a major role going forward, which can act as a supporting function to the conservation. So if, if I had to elaborate a little, uh, let's say communication, can it be a function which can evolve eventually and support the science of conservation? I'll take that. Uh, <clears throat> most certainly, there's no question of if. Uh, we must communicate most effectively. The day of the scientist or the manager in an ivory tower should be over. It should have been over one century ago, right? 
both the gentlemen who are here, uh, Dr. John Singh and uh, Dr. Sukumar, have have uh, excelled in writing uh, popular pieces just as much as they do science, uh, just as much as uh, they do management. Right? Uh, and and I believe in that too. Now. Coming to your, you started with social media and indeed that is the way forward. The world is changing. My two young boys do not read books anymore, although I write it. And so does Dr. Johnson, so does Dr. Sukhma. Nobody reads it anymore. Yeah. So not to say that we should stop writing books because that's what we enjoy doing and hopefully some people will read it. But the youngsters are on their, on their pads and their devices and you have to do it. So about eight years ago, a 22 year old girl who was running comms in my office told me that, sir, you're the CEO, you must tweet. I didn't know what a tweet was. Yeah, I, I knew birds tweet. Yeah, But since then, I said, fine. I said, you teach me, I will do that. And she taught me. She was my guru, right? And now I tweet, uh, and I have 80,000 followers or whatever. Right? So you must do it. You must communicate. Uh, otherwise, I think this is a lost game. Right. So, Sanjay, <laughs> just, uh, I've not followed your uh, advice that, you know, I should start uh, to start. <laughs> But uh, given the recent developments uh, about Twitter, maybe I'm glad that I don't follow your advice. <laughs> no, you do IM, DM, MM, whatever. You ask 15-year-olds, uh, they'll tell you what M to no, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm in a lighter way. You know, I'm just saying it's in a lighter way. <laughs> yes, uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question... No, I, I'll tell you. Sorry, I'll tell you. See, Twitter, I find. Sorry. I'll tell you. See, uh, the problem today is attention uh, span or attention span, you know. We need to think deep. The problem about Twitter today is that uh, you are just sending out a couple of sentences, you know. And very, very often, as a scientist, you know, I rebel in you know, a particular issue can be sort of reduced to just a couple of sentences to be able to express it, you know. But some people may, may be able to very aptly, but not always necessary. No, but you, you don't you need to be very that careful. Tomorrow. The text, you, you can do the a, content, you can do a, a, a whole thread of tweets, and you can. No, no, maybe, maybe, maybe. Whatever. You know, there was a question about North East, I think I can wanna add one or two lines. The North East India, the problem is, you know, what they call shifting calculation, one thing. Second, lot of encroachment. As a result in Assam, for example, lot of habitat has been lost over the years. And habitats are exceedingly productive there. As a result, you know, I mean, uh, like, for example, and... Uh, in Kasiranga and all, with a simple electric fence, you know, they are able to, solar powered fence, they are able to keep the elephants inside. Because still elephants get enough to eat inside the forest area. Although there are problems with the certain weeds like uh, hypomia, acarnia, taking over the water body and so on. And the fabulous plates like Namdafa, for example, there are very few elephants. All the elephants have been captured and removed. So several problems are there. Uh, like uh, declining the elephant population, shifting cultivation, large scale encroachment. There is a huge threat in uh, Northeast India. That's what I wanted to say. So, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, just one more question on the same line uh, with respect to geography or landscape level planning. So, Mr. Roy Pushpak uh, asking uh, you know, whether uh, the conservation policies running in the eastern, eastern region, which is, I would put it this way, that a central region like uh, Odisha, Jharkhand, and then uh, West Bengal, compared to South Indian uh, region, what, what's the difference in, in, in terms of policies or the conservation projects which are running currently? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I will answer that. I think South, we are in a very luxurious position. I mean, in my opinion, uh, uh, in Southern India, you know, uh, application of our mind to, towards conservation by all the Southern states, administration and so on over the years. And the fact that you have a very large concentration of you know, biologists, conservationists and so on in the South has uh, meant that uh, you know, in terms of habitats of by large stabilized South, we have drawn our elephant reserve boundaries and so on, you know, very pragmatically, we've got a good elephant population. So uh, under circumstances, the South India offers the best prospects for long-term conservation. Uh, the opposite is really the East Central India where you know, the last 20 years I've been engaged in various capacities. It, it has, you know, tremendous challenges. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a combination of various, various factors. It's a combination of land use patterns in uh, Central India. It's a combination of mining pressures. Uh, it is, uh, you know, the big large-scale dispersals of elements that have taken place without um, 
you know, efficient or sufficient management action to be able to control conflicts. Because people don't know what to do, you know, should we allow elephants to wander wherever they want to wander? Like, you know, I mean, I am of the very firm opinion that the elephants that were going from Jharkhand deep into South South Bengal, that movement should have been nipped in the bud right in the beginning. And that was the advice that was being given. It was never ever followed. Sort of became, you know, elephants, uh, 50 elephants became 100 elephants, 100 elephants became 200 elephants. You know, one district became two districts, it became four districts, six districts, eight districts. And all hell breaks loose with huge problems in terms of conflicts. You know, and there's no habitat for the elephants there. So what what are you saying, you know? See, we want to conserve elephants for various reasons. One of them is that elephants are keystone species in tropical habitats, and they are an integral part of tropical you know, ecosystem dynamics, you know, dispersal of seeds and so on and so forth. What are they doing in roaming around the vast areas of agricultural land and uh, feeding on crops and you know, taking shelter at night in US? you know, uh, uh, small regenerating uh, plantations of eucalyptus or acacia or eucalyptus. What is the ecosystem role that the elephant is playing there? But unfortunately, over 20 or 30 years, you know, I remember even John saying, all of us, you know, we said that these have really no place in those areas, but nothing was done. Fortunately, the last few years, some efforts have been made to kind of send these elephants, uh, control their movement, their ranges. There's no, there's no real habitat available to natural habitat available to them, except in the border with Jharkhand, which is the Mayur Jarna, uh, you know, elephant reserve. You have to make it more attractive. So, humongous problems. Then, elephants have started dispersing and going to Chhattisgarh and into Madhya Pradesh. And you may have different, differing opinions on this, but it comes with a lot of uh, pain, you know. We might be willing to accept elephants in Chhattisgarh. Elephants were there during the Mughal period. And they were wiped out. So we, we can say now that, of course, they are recolonizing their former habitat or whatever. Yes, it's going to come with a lot of pain because uh, on the ground, the situation has changed a lot. And just two days ago, I had a call from the MP Forest, Forest Department. Elephants have, you know, have reached Madhya Pradesh uh, and we, they want to do something about it. So let's see what happens. So it's a very, very different situation in East Central India. The situation in the Northeast is very different, as John Singh has explained. So they all have different... Uh, sets of problems and challenges that we are doing. Yes, uh, so just uh, one more question or last two questions, but to put it this way, uh, although uh, Mr. Menon has uh, partly addressed uh, this question, but I would also uh, like to ask Mr. Menon once again and also Professor Sukumar, because this question has a, a perspective of climate change too. So uh, when, from the point of view of climate change, and there is a lot of work happening. There's a lot of data is available and the research is still going on. Uh, with that view, the impact on elephants and what is the work uh, uh, or what, what kind of research that been happening in, from that point of view where we can apply the traditional knowledge as well as get, get the new perspective from the climate change and what can be proactively done. Some academic, but uh, would like to understand both of your uh, views. Who's going to go first? Sandeep, you want to name somebody need to go first. You want to, you want to ask who's going to speak first? Who's well, going to Shukumar, I think, I think you, you can go on this, I suppose. You are the expert on climate change. Um, well, I don't know. Well, things are already happening. You know, uh, well, I mean, there have been some model, uh, models recently where people have tried to look at the projections of climate over, you know, Indian subcontinent, how that could affect elephant movements and so on and so forth. But one very common sense, uh, you know, common sense tells me that uh, for all species, it's not just elephants, that elephants will start going to higher elevation with, with warming. Potentially more habitat will open up at higher elevations. Because the temperatures are now changing and higher elevations that were too cold for the elephant are perhaps, you know, elephants do not like those kind of habitats, they will become more attractive. You see a lot of that already happening. It's not just elephants, it's gauge, for instance. You take the nail gris, you know. This is a very simple example. Um, you have elephants, uh, you have gauge now right on the plateau. I have seen elephants uh, for 30 years ago on the upper Bhavani side. When you come from uh, Mukurti, from Salikari, Sitsvara Pass, that, that area that used to be a herd that used to come up, maybe 15, 20 elephants and then go back. You know, 
uh, last week or two weeks ago, you have heard of elephants in Kuno. Mm -hmm. so they have gone from the eastern side, from the rain shadow side, so region of the, of, the, of the Western Ghats, of the Nilgiris, right? So what you can expect, one thing I'll tell you, climate change doesn't want to make the ex elephant extinct in India. The elephant is a gentleist. It's wonderful to adapt and adapt to a wide range of situations. In fact, uh, 30, 40 years ago, we used to say that elephants need forests for survival. Yes. But what type of forest? Elephants though, are not fond of primary forest. They are fond of primary forest. So ironic as it may seem, you know, you go to Kalaya, you go to Arunachala, wherever you cut the forest, you create gaps, you have weedy plants coming in. Elephants love those. You know, even John Singh has co-authored papers with people like Christy and others showing that elephants prefer secondary forest. At the same time, you know, given the the penchant of elephants for agricultural crops, you know, they'll, they'll thrive and they'll survive anywhere. So climate change impacts are, are going to increase elephant-human conflict. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> thank, thank you so much. Uh, so there's one more question uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Shashi Kumar where uh, it's, it's been uh, widely discussed uh, a topic, you know, the reintroduction of cheetah. So uh, uh, Mr. Kumar asked that when we already have uh, so many challenges in front of us when it comes to elephant conservation, and he quotes the example of uh, railway uh, crossing accidents. So uh, why government thinks that it's, it's uh, essential? So uh, any, any point of view, I know it's, it's, uh, it's been discussed, uh, but still he would like to ask that question. Johnson. <laughs> we, we, we can answer it because he was, uh, I think he was initially involved with the project and, uh, you know, when I mean, uh, Ranjit Singh was with the Wildlife Trust of India, they started the ball rolling. Maybe we, we can talk about it. I, uh, did, did you say about Cheetah? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Cheetah reintroduction. Do you want to talk about Cheetahs in an elephant talk, uh, Sanjay? I think I think you can ask the person to write into us and we can, uh, you know, sure. we can yeah, exactly. separately discuss. But I think at the moment, sure. let's focus it on elephants. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. So, so I think I think uh, we are we are we are done with the questions uh, with that, and I, I would like to thank everybody uh, for for taking out time, and I would hand it over to Anusha. Uh, thank you, everyone. Anusha, please take it over. Right. Uh, I would just like to thank all our experts, all our guests. Thank you for giving us your uh, time and answering all the questions very uh, patiently. It was indeed a very holistic conversation, right from biological, ecological, to socio-cultural, as well as policy and governmental aspects covered. So uh, keeping you know the time constraints in mind and uh, our wonderful audience, thank you so much for being patient with us and staying with us till the end of this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Dr. John Singh. Thank you, uh, Sukumar sir, Vivek Menon sir. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for organizing take this care, event. And, uh, take care. Take care, everyone. Thanks to everybody. It's a learning process for me. Sitting alone, you know, I learn a lot by listening to such a presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay thank safe, you. everyone. Stay safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Arun sir. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Bye.